Hi guys, today in, in AP Environmental Science we're going to talk about Earth's atmosphere. So the atmosphere is a really important layer even though it's really thin and that's one of the things that's surprising about it. Uh, when we look at the Earth itself, it's about 4,000 miles thick um, from the crust into the core. So it's really surprising that our atmosphere is only about 300 miles thick and yet it does so many important things for us. It helps filter out harmful radiation it traps heat and keeps us warm without being too warm and it cycles all of these important gases such as water and other gases as well. So the way the atmosphere actually formed and came about in the first place is you had um, the Big Bang that occurred and at that point pretty much everything in, in the universe was these two elements, hydrogen and helium. So as everything was cooling off, these are such small atoms that they were actually able to escape and they didn't stick around and form an atmosphere. But as everything cooled even more, you started having some volcanic outgassing from the center of the Earth. And some of these gases that came out were formed water and ammonia gas and carbon dioxide. The water and ammonia gas formed the primitive atmosphere. The carbon dioxide got dissolved into the oceans. As time went on, living things came around, actually bacteria. And when that happened, that's where we got our current atmosphere. It actually came from those bacteria taking in CO2 and using it to produce oxygen in the process of photosynthesis. Then there were nitrogen fixing plants around and there were also other chemical reactions going on that allowed some of that ammonia gas to turn into nitrogen gas as well. And then a series of other chemical reactions created all the important gases that are in the atmosphere today. But what's really interesting is that the atmosphere that life depends on was actually created by those living things, by those photosynthetic bacteria. So this is what the composition of the atmosphere looks like today. It is 78% N2 nitrogen gas and then 21% O2 oxygen gas. Um, less than 1% of it is argon, but that's the next most common. And then you have lots of small, small amounts of all these other gases. So in your head, you probably feel like CO2 makes up a large percentage of the atmosphere. But if you look at it, it's actually only um, uh, three one hundredths of a percent. That's a very small amount. So uh, when we talk about things like greenhouse gases, what's surprising is even in these tiny little amounts, they can make a big difference. And when you start changing that amount, even by what seems like a little, you can have a big impact. So we need to talk about the different layers in the atmosphere. We have four major zones and they are divided by altitude and you can see them there about how far each one goes up from surface level. And this also goes along with certain temperature and pressure changes as we go through. So that's part of the thing we're going to look at next class. Then you have this layer called the exosphere. This is technically not considered part of the atmosphere. Um, this is where the atmosphere starts to merge with space, but it's really tr hard to define exactly where this happens. Um, the gases here are still gravitationally attracted to Earth, but they're starting to thin out and they're starting to merge with space. So there is such low density that the molecules can't collide and react with each other. Um, this is where we put satellites because you don't want things colliding with them. Uh, you don't want reactions happening, but there's still enough gravity in the exosphere to kind of hold on to those satellites so that they don't wind up floating away. Uh, then if we start to go down from the exosphere, the next one that you encounter is the thermosphere. And I want you to think thermo means heat, right? So this is a warm area, um, temperatures up to 1600 degrees Celsius. It's very, very hot. Uh, that's 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. There's very few air molecules up here. Um, and what happens up here is the UV rays that are coming in from the sun will actually hit uh, the molecules that are there and cause them to ionize. And remember, ionize means that they're gaining or losing electrons, forming a charged particle. Uh, this actually allows radio waves to be able to be transmitted because they are able to bounce off this layer and back down to the ground. And this is where you find the effects of those <coughs> solar winds, um, such as things like Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. That's all happening up in that layer. Then if you go down a little bit 
under that, that is the mesosphere. And I want you to think meso for middle. It's kind of like the middle layer. This is the one that we know the least about. It's very hard to study. You can only access it by using sounding rockets, um, which is not an easy thing to do. We do know that the temperatures decrease significantly here. This is the coldest place on Earth. And this is where our meteors burn up. They collide with those gas molecules and they combust. Then comes the stratosphere, next layer down. And it's called the stratosphere because it's stratified. It's layered, in other words. And it's stratified in temperature zones. So we have different zones of different temperatures and different layers. And part of the stratosphere is the ozone layer, which is very important. We'll talk about it in a second. Now, what's interesting is there's absolutely no convection currents here. So you do have strong winds, but they blow absolutely straight side to side. Um, the jet stream is a good example of these. And planes like to try to fly in this area, those larger commercial jets if they can, or at least right on the edge of the stratosphere. Because when you have these nice straight um, layers and these straight winds, you have really low turbulence, which you will encounter counter as you go down into the troposphere. So one of the really important things here is the ozone layer. And this is a layer of O3 gas that's about 10 to 50 kilometers above Earth's surface, and it acts as our sunscreen. So it's going to observe, absorb about 95% of all those harmful UV rays. And we want that to happen because these are really super damaging. They can mutate our DNA, cause all kinds of problems. So you can kind of see that it filters out all these UVC rays and many UVB rays and once in a while UVA, but not nearly as many. So this is a major ecosystem service that the ozone layer provides for us, filtering out this radiation. And it's actually part of the reason why you get these stratified layers in the stratosphere. Um, the air is hotter towards the top of the stratosphere and cooler towards the bottom because you get under that ozone layer and it's absorbed all that energy. Uh, now, you actually can have ozone closer to the ground in the troposphere. That would be bad. That's not something you want. That is actually considered smog at that point. But we do want it and need it up in the stratosphere where it belongs. Uh, if you don't have enough ozone, you can see this is the list of some of the things that can happen as a result. So it's pretty major to have it there um, because you don't want any of these things occurring. Now, you do need to know a little bit about how ozone forms. So this is the basic reaction. You have these oxygen um, gas molecules, which are O2, up in the upper atmosphere. And those will actually get receive some solar energy and break apart so that they are just oxygen atoms. And then when you have one of those oxygen atoms collide with an oxygen gas molecule, you get ozone. Um, and that's that O3 molecule. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of the ozone hole, so let's talk a little bit about what that is. Since the 1970s, um, during the months of August through November, we've started to notice that this hole, or this really, it's a thin layer of ozone, it's just not as thick as it should be, uh, forms over Antarctica, and another one also forms over the Arctic Ocean, so you're at the poles. And they actually determined that the cause of this was a chemical that was being released called a chlorofluorocarbon, or CFC for short. And this chemical, when it comes in contact with the ozone, starts to break it down, and it forms these holes. So these CFCs are actually coming th from things like refrigerants, air conditioners, aerosol cans. They're used in these processes, and they're released into the atmosphere, and then they're starting to break down that ozone layer. And of course, when you break it down, that harmful radiation is able to come through. So this is an overview of the process. You do want to write down these reactions, and you want to know how it works overall. Um, so those that sunlight, when it hits a CFC particle up in the atmosphere, it actually breaks off a chlorine. And this chlorine is so electronegative, you'll get to this in chemistry in a little bit, but it's really able to pull off other atoms and react with things. So what happens to it is that chlorine 
is able to pull off an oxygen atom from ozone. And at that point, it leaves the oxygen as just regular oxygen gas. That sounds great, but it's not down here where we can breathe it, and it's actually up there where we need the ozone to be. So it's problematic that it does that. Um, so it basically, it takes that oxygen that it has, it combines it with another oxygen, and you wind up with all O2, or oxygen gas, which again is not what we want up there. It's not going to protect us from those UV rays. This is just another diagram. It might make a little bit more sense, depending on which one you like. Use either one, but make sure you understand this process. So one of the reasons I like to talk about the ozone layer at the beginning of the year is this is a really good example of people working together to solve an environmental problem. So this problem was recognized in the 1970s, and by 1978, the US had banned CFCs and consumer products, so industries could no longer produce them. In 1987, many different countries around the world got together and wrote the Montreal Protocol, which basically said that we had to reduce CFC production by 50% by 1998 and limit it even further afterwards. Um, now, the US took the lead. They um, completely phased out these CFCs, um, along with other highly developed countries in 1996. Developing countries were given a little bit longer, so they had phased them out by 2005. And the result of this that's really pretty neat is that the ozone layer is starting to repair itself. It's not fixed yet. It's going to take some time. But you can already see that that hole is starting to seal up. We're starting to um, get a better result there. Um, so this is a really exciting example of how we can fix things if we work together. All right, so once you get down below the stratosphere, you've got to the troposphere. And tropo kind of means turning. So this is where all the convection is happening. This is where we live. It's from sea level to about 11 kilometers or 6 miles above sea level. And here we see the patterns we're used to. The temperature goes down as you go up in altitude, up in height. Um, this is where all our water vapor is and all our weather is occurring. This is where those greenhouse gases are trapping in heat, close to the ground, close to us. Now I want to take a second and make sure we're really, really clear on something. This is kind of a pet peeve of mine. A lot of people, for some reason, confuse the ozone layer with climate change or think they are related. The truth is, they are not directly connected. They might affect each other, but they really, you, you're better off thinking they have nothing to do with each other. All right, so climate change is happening in that troposphere where we live. The ozone layer is up in that stratosphere. That's a totally different layer. Because it's a totally different layer, these things really aren't interacting as much as you think. Um, they're two totally different phenomena. So I just don't want you to confuse them and think that they're related to each other. Please try to separate them in your brain. The ozone layer is helping us from protect us from that harmful radiation, and then those greenhouse gases are trapping in heat, which is a good thing until you get too much of them and it traps in too much heat. All right, so we're going to make a similar kind of map of our layers next class. So you can take a look at this. This is kind of the preview here. Um, and we're going to look at what happens to temperature and density as we go through these different layers. In later classes, we're going to start to look at weather and what causes that. And in order to understand that, you really need to understand what's happening with the density of these molecules and what's happening to air pressure as a result of that. So this is just kind of an introduction for now. But in general, as we go up in altitude, as we're getting further and further from the surface of the Earth, the density of these air molecules is going to decrease. And as you have less air molecules pressing down, that means that your air pressure also starts to decrease. So your very high pressure close to the ground, your lower pressure up further from the ground because you don't have as many molecules pushing down. So if you can start to try to connect this idea of the number of molecules in each layer and because of that number of molecules, the resulting air pressure, it'll help you better later on. All right, so next class, we'll talk about layers of the atmosphere and then we'll move from there into weather um, versus climate. See you tomorrow.